Good morning. We have um, a work session scheduled, uh, a public hearing on a non-germane amendment, and then originally the plan was to do an executive session right after that. And I wanted to announce for everyone here, just in case you're in the obvious, uh, audience for that exec session, that we will not be doing an executive session today. I apologize for that. What we'll do is we will schedule it for next Tuesday, which I believe is May 9th. So if you're interested in any of those bills that we have left to exec, we're gonna move that to next Tuesday to allow us to be better prepared. I don't know what time, I saw that. It probably will be closer to 11 a.m. because we also have a request from someone who has a medical appointment, so we're trying to work around that. Um, next week, the one that we must exec is an early bill, and I believe that's Senate Bill 120 that we might be ready to do others at that time, um, but but we'll get together then. So, Representative Ullery. Well, no, Madam Chair, I did say, thank you, bye bye. So, uh, just doing no execs today. No execs today. So if you're here and you're, you're here for that reason, then you can go home and make another breakfast or something. <laughs> Madam Chair. Because you were here early. Yes, okay. Representative. Um, could I urge uh, this to actually be on Wednesday versus Tuesday, or the only Tuesday, problem or... that problem is a problem because we're now getting very, very yeah, close to the right. deadline. Yeah. So we could do both, maybe. But I, I'm, I hate to wait to the absolute last minute on an early bill deadline, okay. sure. if that's okay. I think I might have to have a, a replacement, but uh, Tuesday I can't make it. But okay, let's. Um, Representative Plett, did you have something? Yeah, I'm wrong. Who we start early on the ninth? You want to start early on the ninth now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, could everyone be here closer to nine a.m. on Tuesday? I just week? need a point of order. Yes. Um, I have. I rescheduled an appointment that they will not reschedule again for three, which means I leave here at one thirty. And I think the rule is you have to be here all day to be in the exec. So just to be a matter of if it's in the morning, I could do it. Okay, so you're talking about next Tuesday? Yeah. Okay. Could people be here at 9 a.m.-ish on next Tuesday? Does that work? Yes. Okay. Good. And we'll try to get our business done between 9 a.m. and what time did you need? Uh, 3.15. Oh, okay. So between 9 and 1.30, yeah. right, should give us the time we need. Thank you so much for your accommodation. I really appreciate that. Okay, with without further ado, we will open up the work session on Senate Bill 112. And oh, we haven't really structured anything for this, but I believe Representative Almy had an amendment she may wish to discuss and have some technical questions. I don't believe I've seen any other amendments on Senate Bill 112. For the Republican, benefit of the Republican caucus, because, well, I've talked to all but one of the Democratic caucus uh, yesterday uh, in a Zoom. Uh, there are complications behind 112, but I see on uh, having to do with what seems to be the, the principal purpose of the sponsor, uh, Senator Ricciardi, Ricciardi, uh, which is to um, assemble more money for problem gaming and get it to the lottery. And um, that is, as the executive director knows, I'm quite sure, uh, but uh, the rest of us, I think, have forgotten or never knew. Uh, there is, on, on the bill that did sports betting, they also created a council for responsible gaming. And instead of putting it in the lottery section, they put it in the commerce part of our laws. And so it's, um, and it's been ramping up and apparently is going to start doing some good stuff now. Um, but 
it was pretty quiet. On the internet, I found, no, no, that was the other group. There is a group that's been around a lot longer. Perhaps Charlie knows uh, when they got started, but the Council on Problem Gaming, which is a nonprofit on, run by a three-person board. I think it looked like only two of them were active, um, which has been receiving the money for problem gaming from lottery uh, on a regular basis and is now two of two of the board are on the, the five person board of the responsible gaming. Uh, the responsible gaming money comes from an administrative expense of the lottery and um, is on uh, appropriated to them in the in the lottery appropriations in the budget and it can be up to 250,000 the for the startup they gave them 100,000 lately they've been giving them uh, well lately no in the next budget they will be getting 250,000 a year and um, the executive director could probably explain better than I could what it's for but it sounds um uh, sounds like they are going to be working with the mental health centers around New Hampshire uh, in developing programs within them spe specifically to problem gaming, to, to gambling addiction, which um, is, and then the other two people on it are from Cambridge, Massachusetts. I wasn't quite sure if it was Cam Cambridge, England, but... <laughs> They, they are um, professors, I believe, and they research on gambling there. So um, it's um, that, so that group gets an, a direct appropriation in the budget, and they're administratively under the lottery, but the lottery doesn't, uh, I think, do a lot of work with them. Um, and the other group might end up somehow merging with this one or <laughs> disappearing. Um, and um, that group has also, I hadn't realized until yesterday from LBAO, on, on been getting money from, from the lottery in a different way somehow. Um, but the lottery was charged in a number of places in the statutes without giving them money for it on uh, with doing something about problem gaming. When every time somebody put a new form of gambling in, they, uh, they were told you ought to do something about problem gaming. So, um, the question is, my the amendment that I was putting forward was to take all of this, um, was to take the money from this bill, paramutual racing and historic horse racing, um, into a dedicated fund so that it would be more visible and ability, more somewhat more ability to figure out on um, what they were doing. But that was before I knew all about this stuff. And I think now the situation is more complicated. We need discussions, lottery, council on problem gaming, on, on the, and the people interested from this committee in, um, in adding a, putting instead this could pass as it, as it is, and I think not mess things up, but, um, and, and then that part of it be done, but then we need to figure out how, how those agencies and the money flowing to them gets put together in such a way that the money that Senator Ricciardi wanted to send to them doesn't just 
replace part of the money that's already going to them, but also would um, not be frittled away. And I'm sure that the executive director is on top of this in some ways. So, so th that's what I wanted to say. Would it be helpful to hear from Lottery of what, what is going on with these funds? Would you be available, Mr. McIntyre? Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Charlie McIntyre. I have the privilege of being the director of Hampshire Lottery. Um, originally, when um, I believe it was Kino was passed, there was a separate fund created uh, in HHS to address problem gaming. And that fund was <laughs> funded <laughs> by um, certain parts of Kino revenues. Um, HHS didn't do anything with it for several years. And so that fund grew to be, I think it was $800,000. And it just sat there and nothing happened, nothing happened. And um, S Governor Sununu, through his budget office, then created the Council for Problem uh, Responsible Gambling that was initially tied to us, thinking we would move faster and do things faster. Um, it is a bit, um, it's a bit difficult, as you can imagine, being the chief bookie and then also having administratively tied the Problem Gambling Council. It's, it's you know, it's it would be characterized in professions as bipolar. Um, and so, I, we they're administratively tied to us. So under the current law, they're administratively tied to us. So we help them with things like purchasing and budgeting, procurement. Uh, they use our office space. They use our facilities, their copy machines, et cetera. Um, but that we, I don't have anything to do with them, as you can imagine. I'd love to do it, but it doesn't make any sense. It would look unseemly. Uh, and so there's funding sources, obviously, as Representative Almi suggested, but unless it's similarly budgeted, if we make more, like for example, if, if this bill passed and breakage was a million dollars, the remaining 750 would not go to problem gambling, it would go to the general fund because it was budgeted for $250,000. And so um, that has been the case for a number of years of the revenue sources that exist now. And certainly uh, as the person who is in charge of regulating and operating gambling in the state, um, I would be delighted to help in any way possible to promote more uh, services. Uh, the council is now reaching out to train, essentially trainers in addressing problem gaming. Um, it's a very small percentage of people, but it affects their lives deeply. It ends up being about one and a half percent of, to two percent of people who gamble have a problem. And I'll define that, I mean, I'll air quote that it's that they have an issue um, and need, need, need services. So um, that's the history of the, where it is now, it is, like I said, administratively tied to us. There are a number of, uh, as Representative Almy said, there are a couple of professionals who have done this as, I believe they were psychologists, uh, professors, they were certainly um, educated, uh, who have done it now. Uh, the council, the executive director, is a former Massachusetts correctional officer who himself was a problem gambler, uh, and he lives in New Hampshire now. He, he grew up in Fall River. Um, and he runs it, and he actually will answer calls from people on his cell phone. So if folks who have a problem will call. And the council gets maybe a few dozen calls a month from people who have issues, and they try to match those folks with services. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, Representative Platt. Yes, this is directed to uh, Representative Almy. Uh, do, do, have we got a copy of that amendment that you had? No, it isn't. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Somehow I missed it. Um, one five two eight. You can look at mine. Okay. Oh, and what well, I understand it needs changing anyway after t discussion. I, well, I, as I understand, you're doing something. I, I want to ask you a question. Okay. Oh, could I ask him a question first, and then we get to the procedural issue? Sure. It's a work session, so we're a little more flexy. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, does that? It sounds like what that is, is if breakage gets above 250, you're taking money that was supposed to be going to the ETF and sending it to the general fund? No, it goes to the education trust fund. It, no, it goes to the education trust fund. All, all of our revenues are by 
Yeah, you said G, GF. Oh, I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, my apologies. I misspoke. It's the Education Trust Fund. Good. Thank you. Okay. Did you found it? Okay. I do, I do have it. Thank you. All right. And just to get back to Representative Almy, are you happy with this amendment as is? Uh, I and am. I am happy with this amendment as is. On the thing that I'm wondering about is, I understood Representative Plett was trying to work on each wager. That language. The redistribution of each wager instead of based on each dollar waging, wagered. And so I thought there were going to be two amendments we were looking at. Representative Plett, do you have amendment on this bill? I have the one that she said it was in front of me, and it was. Oh, at but the yours. Huh? One of yours. One of mine? Yeah. What did Aren't I do? Are you going to work on, on the, the uh, whether we should be why we should change based on each dollar wagered to of each wager? No. No. Oh. <laughs> Who said that then? Oh. Did you work on it? Would, would it be possible first, since we first started with Representative Almy's amendment, could you walk us through the whole thing just so we fully understand it and we can ask you questions right. and then if it's appropriate, then maybe Representative Fellows, you can tell us about your thoughts. I was just answering my question about where that came from, but I think we have kind of like two totally different issues going on here. One of them is we started kind of with a discussion of what's going on with the problem gambling and the money related to that. And then the the other issue in in my mind is the language that we have about breakage because from what I have been able to learn, and I, you know, I did some research, is that the language in both the bill and in rules about breakage doesn't, um, does not reflect how breakage is actually calculated and, and probably, but I don't know for sure, what's actually occurring with the breakage. So those to me are sound like two totally different issues. I think we should do one at a time. Yes, I agree. Two totally different issues in here, and hopefully we can sift through that. I have heard there is ongoing problems with that language on breakage. So it may be something that has to be worked on more than just a day. So we'll see about that, and then maybe this bill turns into something else. I don't know. I don't know. So we'll have to see. So would you want to walk us through your amendment? Uh, yes, it's... Uh, it's easier referring to my yellow, <laughs> yellow piece because um, they read, as usual, they redid the whole thing, and so it's hard to tell what the b original bill changed and what I changed. But the first piece of it is on line 19, uh, eight, 19, no, 8, uh, no, 19. Um, sorry. No, I don't have numbers on my. On where, where does this thing? It, it looks to me like the first change you're making is on line twenty-two, twenty-three of the uh, amendment. Oh yeah, there it is. Thank you. <clears throat> on, I'm. On. Uh, what I did was to add take out and used as payment and said instead uh, b both of them say paid to the lottery commission i took out as used and used as payment and i replaced it with to be deposited in the problem gaming fund under rsa 284.22c which i create at the end um, and Really, most of this, except for that part at the end, is um, doing exactly the same thing in the others. The next one is line six on page two. Takes out and used as payment, adds in to be deposited in the problem gaming fund under RSA 284.22c. And then the third one is in Roman four, 
um, on line 20, uh, takes out and used as payment and replaces it with to be deposited in the problem gaming fund under RSA 284-22C. Then uh, when you get to historic horse racing, um, which it, um, yeah, line 30, yes, uh, it, it takes out and used as payment. Well, I guess that's exact, almost the same thing. And used as payment for problem gaming services, and it instead says paid to the Lottery Commission to be deposited in that fund. And uh, then there is a new section at the end on after Section 22B, which creates Section 22C, Problem Gaming Fund, and that's found on page three in the amendment. And it defines it as provided providing funding for the identification and treatment of problem game gamblers, um, non-lapsing, continually appropriated to the Lottery Commission. Um, and uh, the fund shall receive all the monies from breakage under everything that is in this bill. Um, and then it creates, which is where I started, it creates a 612 uh, uh, notation so that the problem gaming fund is in the list of dedicated funds. Um, and when you do a dedicated, you add a dedicated fund, they always give it subparagraph 387 would be the next one since last year. But there may be three different ones coming in, and um, in enrolled bills, they would change the 388 to whatever number it comes up to be. There are about 120, I think, dedicated funds that we have repealed since we started doing num numeration. It used to be alphabetical. <laughs> uh, and so we really don't have 387 in existence right now, but it's up there. Okay. So that, that's, that's what I was doing. And so can I just ask though, so right now we, all, we already have a problem gaming fund effectively we, or the, for the- We currently have two in the state. What, uh, they're talking right now, but uh, what happened to the 400,000 odd dollars that were sitting in HHS <laughs> and not being used that, that uh, Mr. McIntyre told us about okay. <laughs> just now. So th this is the kind of thing that that bothers me in I, in dedicated funds that mm -hmm. we are always needing to try to yep. get different things that different people were doing at different times and put them together in the same place if they're trying to do the same thing and one of them isn't doing anything. Yep. Do you want to, Madam Chair? Oh, yeah. Uh, Mr. McIntyre, we. We're getting in the weeds on this uh, problem gaming fund question. And uh, so this amendment would make a new problem gaming fund to deal with all the breakage as mentioned in this bill. What? So can you update us on that money that was in the other fund? Because what we don't want to end up having is three different funds. Yeah, doing, you know, we're trying to figure this the, out. The HHS fund. So that fund actually was never expended and dropped at the bottom line as a transfer to the education trust fund. Oh, it did. Correct. Yes. Okay. And fun fundamentally, there'd be no need to send a fund. You could just literally have an expense on our bottom line for problem gambling, and we would just spend it. There's no need for it. Obviously, it's your prerogative, but a dedicated fund is, unless you don't want to make, change the nature of the funds, because obviously, if it didn't spend, the year would lapse. So, but um, <laughs> if you change the budget to increase or that amount, it would we would obviously set it aside and spend it. Right, so that's one of the questions is, do we really want it to be non-lapsing if it's never spent for a couple of years while people are figuring out what it's needed for? Well, fundamentally, 
that was the problem at first. There was no question. Mm -hmm. It was not used. It went to HHS, which obviously had a very large construct and had difficulty creating a separate small thing. Uh, so yeah, but now it is actually active and is spending funds and providing services, although limited. Um, so yes, it would be expended. Uh, Representative Almi, did you have more to add on that? No, I think I. Okay, Representative Junigan. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess one question I have is, how big, how big is breakage? Because if breakage, if all breakage is going into this fund, I mean, is it is it too much? Yeah. So I guess, do we have any idea? So the question is, we actually uh, thank you for the question, Representative. We were literally discussing that when I was seated back with my colleague. Um, currently, it would just be around 250. Ironically, um, it would be our expectation that that number would grow um, based on historic horse racing, increasing revenues monthly and new facilities coming online. So I think it would be just about what you would is budget in the budget now, um, but it would be larger in f ex uh, next fiscal year and thereafter. Representative Phyllis. I'm, I'm still not clear on when you're talking about HHS. What are you talking about? Sure, um, Representative, the, when Kena was originally passed in 2016, 17, the sale of Kena tickets, um, a percentage of the revenues was dedicated towards a, a problem gambling, and that money was set aside in a fund that was administered by HHS. They never did anything with it. The, number, the, the fund just grew and continued to grow. And so it was just a, 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 a growing fund. And so when it transferred to us, that those funds dropped to our bottom line as a transfer and went to the Education Trust Fund as essentially revenues of the lottery. And so now the funding of the Problem Gambling Commission or Council is done through the lottery as an expense of ours. Okay, so really that's, that is not in the picture currently. Correct. So, so my, my real question here has to do with um, the amount of money going to problem gambling issues. And if it's going to, if the amount is going, going to increase, you know, what, what does it really need to increase? Because what exactly is going on? So one of the things I did, I did some research and I, first of all, to help everybody understand, there are two New Hampshire councils related to gambling. And one of them's called is New Hampshire C Council on Responsible Gambling. And that is a commission that m the members are appointed by the governor. And then there's another one that's called New Hampshire Commission on Problem Gambling. Excuse me. So the second one is called New Hampshire Commission on Problem Gambling, and that's a nonprofit institution. And that the um, the Commission for Responsible Gambling doesn't really. I mean, they meet, but they have a to get the work done. They have a contract with the Commission on Problem Gambling, which is the nonprofit. So I looked at reports about what's going on with that in the expenditures, and I looked at their website, which had minimal information. One of the things it did is it listed places um, where you could go to Gamblers Anonymous meetings. Only one was in New Hampshire. The other ones were in Maine and Massachusetts. Um, on one page, I looked at it, and there was a link on, I guess, their partners down at the bottom that said um, drug and alcohol, and I clicked on that, and it went to some sort of ad for gambling, which is, means the website, I don't know, been hacked or something. I'm sure that was not the intent. It's, I don't know, some kind of hacking or something went on with that, which is like, you know, that, that would be very, some people would think that would be very funny, obviously. So I'm just concerned that 
and I looked at some of the minutes of the meetings and they're, you know, they get calls from maybe 15 people with gambling problems over a couple of months. And it just, if we're going to put more money in this, I think maybe there should be some more specifications <laughs> on how it's used. And, and also the fact that one person is on both of these councils. And I've never heard of a situation where a council would have be responsible for a contract with a person that's on the council. It just, it seems irregular to me. Um, Those are my concerns. Certainly. So they're administratively tied to us. And uh, so I don't, I don't, we don't manage them. I, I have no responsibility as you can imagine because of the, in, both of them. Literally, when it comes to problem, we just make the money uh, in this context and, and spend it. And our CFO reviews their expenditures. Uh, our chief compliance officer helps them with contracting and permitting, uh, not permitting, but if there's a, a, a council matter, like the executive council matter that does the. So if you ask questions about their operations, you're going to have to ask the, the them. Yeah, and we don't we don't want to grill the director here, but um, maybe maybe this is something we have to work on in a different bill, as Representative Almi mentioned, because and maybe we ask those folks, we know yeah. what the details are. Representative Fellows. Yes, but the the chair of the Council of Responsible Gambling is an employee yes. of the lottery. Exactly. Yes, she so, is. So, and that's who. When I wanted to see um, a report. I called the number on the website, and that's where it went. And she sent me the report. So how yes. you, how can you say you're not involved? Because her her role her role in there, I don't supervise her in that role. Quite literally, I do not supervise her as the chair of the the council. She handles it as she, as she sees the best interest, and she's confirmed by the executive council, and has been I think twice. So. All right. This sounds like we might need a, a different work session on the deeper dive of that, and maybe invite some of those folks to see if they'll join us. Uh, Representative Ames, did you want to add anything? Just, just a few words because I do agree that this is really a, a separate discussion that we need to pursue, um, and I absolutely support funding for um, the prevention and um, and help directed towards those who might or do engage in problem gambling. Um, and I also want to commend the director of the lottery for supporting that as well throughout his career. And uh, I know that from the time when I chaired the gaming, uh, uh, New Hampshire Gaming Commission back in maybe 2013. Um, and uh, not only you, but uh, Ed Talbot, who is the uh, person that has been mentioned mm -hmm. indirectly, but not by name, um, who himself is a recovered or recovering, I don't know what the right lingo is, but uh, a man who experienced serious problem uh, gambling and its effects, um, and who has persevered through all of this time uh, working on this issue and uh, finding toeholds here and there to keep going. I know he was very helpful to, to me when I did my work uh, at that time. Um, so, um, yes, uh, we need the funding. That's one issue. We need to be sure that the funding is properly used, and that's another issue. And uh, I think it would help all of us because problem gambling keeps popping up as we deal as the sole committee in the House responsible for gambling with um, this question of problem gambling, and it keeps cropping up in the statutes, as Representative Almey has, has noted, um, with different language. I note that in this bill, uh, it's, it's money for problem ga gambling, which is a strange way of putting it. And then uh, in Representative Almey's language is for the identification and treatment of problem gambling. Um, and if I were writing it, I would have added prevention as another funded activity. Um, but it's something we need to focus on, I guess, is what I'm, I'm uh, pointing to. 
um, if we pull back to this bill that's in front of us um, and the question of allocating breakage to it, um, I think we could go forward, although I'm now pausing because of this question of is it too much money or too little, and uh, maybe it's better to just do it by appropriation, which is where it's landed right now. It goes through the House Bill 1 appropriation process, House, House Bill 1 and 2, and, uh, and uh, maybe that's where judgments are made about how much money is needed and how much has been spent as part, part of the budgeting process. And uh, it would be an expense item, and uh, part of the review would be whether it's sufficiently independent of the lottery. So maybe it's in just the right place. Um, and uh, maybe uh, we can discuss this. Uh, uh, we don't need a separate allocation of the breakage, but I kind of like seeing that happen. And uh, um, I'm just not sure about that. So uh, I don't know where that leads us, but that's sort of a... Uh, expressing my thoughts on an issue that's evolving as we sit here. So I can make two points, Ben. I know I'm a member of the House, so I wanted to make two points which I thought would be relevant. Um, first, I think I originally gave the council the idea for a dedicated fund because when I was at the mass, when I was mass lottery, I was the general counsel there, and I wrote the language that f permanently funded them because their budget had been cut to zero, and so they got a specific an account from the mass lottery revenues. That was dedicated for life and was non lapsing. So the, I think the idea came from us, or me personally. So I apologize. <laughs> um, second, um, when the council was originally funded back with Kino revenues, at the time our revenues from all gambling was around 70 million. This year it'll be 180. So uh, if you if the problem was X in 2015 16, it's probably more than that now. So I would suggest that funding it. Overfunding it probably isn't a problem. It sounds like there's a lot more to discuss on the the fund itself, how it's structured, and so forth. Um, should we maybe go back to talking about the breakage definition? Do we have any experts here, including the director, yeah. uh, on the breakage definition? <laughs> so, so as I as I was leaving the room, I realized what the question was. Representative Fellows had and. And the answer. So and I apologize for, as usual, Murphy's Law having it too late. So all horse racing is based on a two-dollar wager. So if you go to, if you go to a tote board, you go on the board the two-dollar wager, and so what you get paid off of that is on the board. So if the horse that you bet on say wins three forty, you win your bet on a two-dollar bet times three forty. So if you bet ten dollars, you win thirty-four dollars, and the breakage would have come off of that three. As I understand it, the breakage would have come off of that three dollars and forty cents while multiplied ten times. So you don't get. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, President Platt, did you have a question? Yeah, you, you your math just escaped. You said it was a two dollar bet. Correct. So, 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 so Representative Fellows used the analogy of a ten dollar bet or a ten times bet, yeah, yeah. meaning that zero would always make it two. zero. Okay. Um, but so it's really. Five times the three dollars and forty cents, or ten times the three dollars and forty cents. Doubled it. Five times well, the three forty, right? Correct. If it's five times, you would win seventeen dollars, or seven. No, yeah, seventeen dollars. But the break, which would come off of the three dollars and forty cents, if say the actual winning amount was three dollars and forty one cents, you would get five pennies would go to breakage, and three forty would go to winnings. As I understand it. I see some hands up. Representative Ullery? So you're telling us that this is the only industry where breakage is profitable? I, I don't know that. I don't know that to be the case. I, I, I... There's a hole underneath my chair on the I, floor. Honestly, just I, at this so point, I would just give you the money back I, with my salary. If I don't have to define breakage again. But... Representative Fellows. I just want to say that Rick Newman explained it to me. Uh, you know, since since we met the last time in right, and and he went step by step, and I understood it completely. But it it needs to the to for for me to grasp it, it needed to slow down a little and go step by step. So we might want to consider that. Yeah, if someone could maybe I don't know draw draw it out on a diagram or something so we can sure. understand uh, how this actually. Matt, works. Yeah, that's an excellent excellent suggestion. I will I will send you a page definition 
by the close of the business this week, explaining breakage and how it works both for, I know this sounds odd, but horse racing, which is easier than historic horse racing, which is just slightly more complicated, believe it or not, but you'll get a definition. And if there are any of the vendors that do the historic horse racing can give us any help on this too, that would be helpful because it's, we're dealing with two different. Correct. And also different it's going to vary by vendor. Quite literally, it's going to vary oh. by vendor. So. so that's why it's hard to find what works for everyone. Ah. Uh, other hands over here on this side? Yes, Representative Orse. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks for taking my question. So if I understood what you said, whether it's a $2 wager or a $10 wager, if someone wins $3.43, $0.03 is the breakage. If it was a $2 bet, that means the breakage gets six cents. If it's a ten dollar bet, the breakage gets thirty cents. Nope. You, okay, you I'm confused. Multiply it by five because it would be <laughs> based off of two dollars, so it'd be a three to four, a three dollars and forty cent wager would be the amount you would win off of two dollars. So you would. I don't want to get into odds making, but it would be say a three dollars and forty three cents. Three cents would be breakage. I got the three cents part. Yeah. So how much actually goes to breakage if it's a ten dollar bet? It would be 15 cents. 15 cents. Because it's five $2 bets. Five $2. It's five shares of the wind pool. Okay. I, I got that, but I don't know if I that's could explain it back. Thank you. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Representative Elberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, when some of us learn different ways, so when you send out your explanation sheet, if you could try to send, give us information in different ways, such as percentages as well as examples, it would certainly be helpful to me. Thank you. Sure, uh, absolutely. Representative Omi. Thank you. Is it possible to do that for horse racing and for the machines on with and without the change of language yeah. from based on each dollar to of each way i believe so i uh, certainly we'll give it that an effort would be lovely yes Thank you. okay great we'll get another few minutes other questions yes representative spilsbury yeah this is a very minor suggestion i wouldn't file an amendment to do it but if we're rewriting this um online page uh, one of the bill line 18 where it says multiple of 10 i got the impression that this was confusing and just adding the word sense multiple of 10 of what it's the multiple of 10 of the odd sense so just putting the word sense in in each of the four places that it occurs i think would eliminate some confusion I apologize. You're looking at the bill itself, right? Not the amendment? Yes, whether it's the bill or the amendment. Because um, I didn't see. Okay, got it. Thank so, you. So it, in each of these four passages uh, that are amended, the phrase to the next lowest multiple of 10 add cents four times. Mr. McIntyre, does that help or hurt, do you think? Um. I don't know. I don't have the. I only have the amendment in front of me, not the bill. I'm sorry, Representative, Madam Chair. If with it, yeah, yeah. I only see it in the bill. I don't see it in the amendment. So when you get a minute, we we have more time on this bill. Oh, it is in the amendment. I couldn't find it. It's yeah, just maybe a different line. The amendment restates the same line passage. Line twenty. Okay. Line twenty. Oh, line twenty. Okay. We've never had an issue before with it, so. Representative Leapley. Um, my question doesn't have to do with breakage, so I can See wait. <laughs> Mr. McIntyre has a response <laughs> first, and then we'll go over there. <laughs> I'm sorry. So do you, what do you think about adding the word sense to the, uh, line 20 oh. of the amendment? Does that make any sense? Do you want to think about it? Don't think about it. Sorry, yeah. I, yeah, please. I, I just okay. saw it. I, 
and I don't. Yeah, I just, I, you know, this is really technical in terms of how this is actually going to impact. Because what one of the difficulties is how the it's the, how the simulcast defi the tracks define breakage matters how it comes in as well as how the manufacturers of the machine define breakage. So I don't want to overly limit that and have have them change programming based off it. So you've got hundreds of machines in the field now, all of which are programmed and tested, which is a very expensive process. Uh, each one has been t run through a lab. So I don't want to speak, you know, shoot from the hip as it were, about changing how they would do programming. And then you'd have to pull several hundred machines potentially off the field, retest them based off of new requirements. That's all. So. You want to say the, the issue, Madam Chair, I believe. Madam Chair. Representative Fellows. I, I, you might want to consider if you have to put in the $2 there because it's a wager of, that's computed on a wager of $2. Cor correct. It, that's h traditional horse racing. I would have to confirm with the manufacturers as to what their wagering basis is or what breakage is defined yeah, by that. So, oh. okay. Can I assume, or maybe I shouldn't assume anything anymore, um, if if when you go to the racetrack and when you're doing simulcast, would it be any different? Um, would it be different? I'd have to check. I'd have to check, please. Well, okay. okay, so staying with the breakage concept, other questions on breakage? Representative Ullery? Just to follow up, in the shipping industry, breakage and spoilage have entirely different meaning than they do here and that's what i was referring oh to. okay oh, oh, oh certainly it does so the liquor business too so <laughs> okay um representative Liebling, did you thank you um i just wanted to reaffirm that i think this is a really important issue and that we need to make sure that it's funded um generously and in a way that will grow as gambling in the state grows um i'm sure Lots of people here have their own experience with this issue. Um, I was a victim. My family was a victim of some of a gambler who like devastated our finances and um, his own life and the life of many people around him. And just in trying to understand this issue, listening to um, some of the webinars looking around online, um, it sounds like we don't have a great handle on who is gambling on the state in the state, how many gamblers there are. Um, but just if I were to put together some numbers that I've heard and and maybe you can correct me if you have better information. But one of the um, webinars I was looking at last night said that there were probably 65,000 um, gamblers in the state. And um, I, I certainly. I have all those numbers in my head as well as in right. data form various ways. Okay. You'd have to define gambler or right. still, sort of what they do and I could give you the number as to how many do it. Right, so where I was going with this and, and I welcome you to, to sure. jump in, but I was starting to put together, okay, if 2% of gamblers are problem gamblers and there are 65,000 gamblers in the state, that's 13,000 people who would have a problem with gambling. So it would be that would be 150, 1,200. 1,300. 1,300. Thank yeah. you. I, I, that's, I know a lot of you have a math background, <laughs> so thank you. Um, so that's like $190 um, per person if we're talking about $250,000 yeah. in an account, right? So I think it's – I'm really happy that we're spending some real time thinking about this issue. Um, because as I looked around and thought about what we were doing, it, it almost appeared like what we're doing is obviously the state advertises gambling a lot, right? We're telling people they should go gamble. We're encouraging them to go gamble. We're spending money encouraging people to gamble in the state. So I just want to be cognizant of, of that. And on the other hand, like you said, we also want to support people who have um, a problem. And it kind of seems like the way we're supporting them right now is really just, I mean, if we're talking about a budget of $250,000, it's gonna be communication, right? It's gonna be a billboard that says, hey, call this phone number, hey, call these people. It's not gonna be actually paying for mental health services for folks, right? And the other thing I picked up as I was reviewing this information last night is 76% 
generally, not in New Hampshire, of people who have a gambling problem also have a problem with drugs or alcohol. Yeah, so it seems like it's a pretty sophisticated mental health sure. nexus of events um, that is going to require some sort of support beyond, you know, a fraction. We're going to, if we're going to spend a fraction telling people, here's the hotline to call Gam Gamblers Anonymous, we're going to spend 1% of a budget doing that. And, you know, a million dollars times, I don't know what amount telling people to go gamble, that doesn't seem very well thought out. So I'm glad that we're, we're going to stop and think about how much money are we dedicating to this and where's that money going? Is it just going to make a flyer to tell people like they can call someone, but there's actually no support there. And it does sound like there are some real experts um, in the psych psychological field who are doing research in this area who understand um, this nexus. So it does sound like we can consult with people and find out how to do this well. So I just wanted to um, support uh, Representative Ames comments that this is is a really important issue and I'm really glad we're spending time on it and I hope that we will fund it adequately and set it up so that it is successful and overseen um, adequately so thank you for dedicating the time to this this morning absolutely and Representative Malloy thank you uh, I wanted to address Representative Leapley just said, I think we were watching the same video. And I wrote down from that 65,000 were problem gamblers. That's what that I thought that video said. And 8,000 were pathological. Did I hear that wrong? Or was that? Uh, okay, I just wanted to put that out there. It seems strange <laughs> but i don't know i don't know where you got that do you know where who put that out that uh, that video was uh sent uh, i i got that from uh representative ames and that was mr talbot that was uh uh mr okay. talbot who was okay uh, i don't believe i saw that email so thank you okay other hands up yes representative Sheberg. Uh thank you madam chair uh just going back to representative almy's amendment there is no problem with anyone here about the words to be deposited, changing it from used as payment. Is there any problem with those words by anybody here? Well, it doesn't matter. It's all three. Uh, line six on Representative Almy's amendment, line 20. It changes the th line 30. I just want to make sure we're just going to be going to one other area when we do go to the study. The word de to be deposited is what... Representative Almy said instead of and used as a payment on all all the lines. I just I'm just asking a question here. Does does anybody have an objection to what she has written to be deposited versus it, used as payment from the original bill? It just seems clearer. I'm sorry, Representative Southworth, which one seems clearer to you? Uh, the, the change made by Representative Almy. The deposited. Yeah, to okay. be deposited just as much more specific. Okay, gotcha. And Representative Ullery, I see a light. Yeah, two things. Not to follow up on this immediately. When you put in it into the fund as established by 284.22c, that is what it, the payment comes from. So you're, That's you're absolutely correct. I would like to ch uh, ask a question, please. Previously, this breakage fund went as a kind of an incentive to the game operator. Is that correct, sir? It was split three ways. It was split uh, the operator, us, and state treasury. Okay. What if, if follow up, Madam Chair? What would be the effect on the uh, stimulus or the incentive, but incentivization of the uh, game operator? Would it have a deleterious effect on operating these games, or, or how's that going to work? I mean, they would lose the revenues. It's simple as that. In some states, I think breakage is 100% to the operator. Uh, and so it, it would be revenue that would be lost by the specific entity, um, which is Seabrook. The store course rating op uh, operators, 
have already had this baked in with them in terms of breakage. Um, I don't think they'd be a bit opposed, but I, I'll have to check with them. It's, it's on follow up again, ma'am. So if we were to eliminate the incentive, we uh, would uh, disincentivize offering this game to other individuals, which then in turn would reduce the amount of uh, funds going into the problem gaming uh, category. I mean, yes, it's less profitable for them. Thank you. Okay, Representative Leapley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to share the, the video that was referenced um, is available on YouTube. It's New Hampshire Council for Responsible Gaming put it up and it's a conversation about problem gaming prevention and treatment in New Hampshire with members of the New Hampshire Council on Problem Gaming, uh, which is the other one, and the New Hampshire Council for Responsible Gaming. So both of them together participated in that video. Okay, Representative Olney. I turn it on and it turns off. Uh, on when we were dealing with the idea of a major casino, we went into a lot of the statistics, and one of the things that um, we found out on was that the addiction rate could rise near a major casino, the people who lived near there and could go daily, to 8% of the gamblers. So that may be where that eight <laughs> number came from. But what this would be doing if we passed it on this uh, at this point would, ju would simply be taking all of that money and specifying that there is a dedicated fund on, I called it the problem gaming fund just out of something in my head from the past. I have no, no, I, no, no concern with what it's actually called. Um, but on, it, it would not be changing anything else in this. The thing that is changing stuff is if we fool around with what each wager is. Senator Elberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, firstly, just to respond to Representative Schamberg's question, I agree. I like the language, the way it's it's presented now, that very clear funneling. Um, I'm not sure if, if you're asking for that information. but um, And to follow up on Representative Leapley's comment about um, problem risky, risky behavior uh, in one of my earlier lives, I was, uh, I ran uh, alcohol and later uh, drug abuse programs, which were at that time considered totally different. Um, most of us know they're not. But it's clear that risky behaviors that include gambling, that include uh, substance misuse, uh, um, smoking, unprotected sex with multiple partners, um, driving ridiculously fast in bad places to do that tend to be connected. Uh, and it might be worth, not instead of this, but at some point to consider trying to set up some kind of commission or organization to address the whole notion of risky behavior. Um, when I was working in the field, the it was clear that the uh, gateway drug, which many people thought was marijuana, was not, but in fact was tobacco. Uh, and it was the, the most simple predictor of further substance misuse. So all of those things are connected. Thank you. Representative, I'm not sure who had their hand up first. Representative Fellows, I apologize. I was taking notes. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just have one idea and then I have two technical questions. So my idea is that in terms of how we split the breakage, when once we figure out how much that is, that it doesn't have to be the same for a track or simulcast or the HHS machines. Just not to discuss now, but just the idea that it could be, doesn't have to be the same for all of them. And my questions 
had to do with I, I saw an I saw an ad on TV and it was for sports betting and they were talking about the Kentucky Derby. So can you tell me is it is can you know, I was thinking that horse racing would be under these laws, but I saw something on the ad on TV. Uh, so uh, thank you for the question. The we don't currently accept horse racing wagers through our sports betting platform. And it, and it's not it's, there'd have to be some kind of statute change to do that. So there's another bill pending before you called advanced deposit wagering, which sort oh, of yeah. corrects. So currently the status is there are operators taking wagering on horse racing over mobile and internet that we do not regulate. They're doing it currently. There are a few operators that do that. I don't believe they advertise on TV, but I do know that they will send emails and the like. We don't regulate them currently. There's a bill um, before you to, to, to bring them under the fold and legalize the activity. Okay, thank you. When you say operators, you mean vendors. V vendors, yeah. Mobile vendors. vendors. Yeah, so yeah, there's um, Churchill Downs was one. They, they've ceased operations uh, or postponed. Um, there's one called TVG uh, that does it as well. It's a, it's a small niche market currently. They operate under a gray area um, under a federal law called the Interstate Horse Racing Act of 1978, which they allege makes them legal. We don't believe it does. RAG said it's gray. Why don't you fix it in the statute? So that's why the law bills okay, before Okay, let's keep going around the room. And, and I, the other question I had is in terms of where the money goes for the problem gambling, it goes to that the Council for Responsible Gambling so is that in statute or is that in rules where where is that it's in the sports betting rules statute statute, statute. yeah it's in the sports betting law yeah yeah statute yeah sorry it's, it's been so many times that has been referenced in so many bills that have passed this body i i, I, I lose track but yes sports betting yeah. okay other hands up on this side of the room representative ames yep I just wanted to uh, make this point that um, as we've talked about the issue of problem gaming, some some uh, numbers have been mentioned about the number of gamblers out there uh, and then the incidence of responsible gaming. I just want to caution everyone. Uh, um, there's been a lot of research, there's a lot of data that is available. I, I, I don't want to... I don't want us to be walking away from here thinking that there are 165,000 problem gamblers in New Hampshire. I'm not sure that's right. Uh, I see Director McIntyre agreeing with me, so maybe you could uh, speak on that. Well, well certainly. So um, if there are a million adults, giving round numbers of the state, about a million adults, we sold about half a million of them a Powerball ticket last year, or two, or three, or more. So that's the largest product we have in terms of breadth. But it's very, because of the velocity, because the drawing's only every other third day, you, you can't play as often. So problem gamblers don't really go to Powerball. So the universe of problem gamblers who do Powerball is very, very low because it doesn't happen very often. Whereas sports betting is a very small market, meaning we only have about 100,000 registered users. And any given month, we only have between 30 and 50,000 people who access the platform. And that includes folks from out of state. So you're talking in-state problems. If it's 2%, sports betting might be a higher because it's velocity because you can play more often. There's always sporting events on. And so you have to sort of, when you define gambler, it's a Powerball player to a sports better. You know, velocities, which I, I've read literature, which is a very, how accessible it is and also how often you can play, meaning can you play immediately or do you have to wait three days? will help to find if it's a problem or not for the person because or create the problem. So I'd say the number is probably close to 15, 20,000 people in the state. Maybe 15,000 would have maybe an issue. And based on the calls we get, the council gets, it gets maybe a dozen, two dozen, three dozen calls a month. But also, for example, we have um, the DraftKings platform and our iLottery platform have um, 
functions that you can call in and say, I want to exclude myself because I have a problem or whatever. And those have hundreds and hundreds of people. And I think the DraftKings platform exceeds the thousand people now exclude themselves, will voluntarily exclude themselves. And there are rare instances, but it does happen where a person will have will use the call center and use language which we believe is a problem, meaning I need to win this month because of my mortgage payment, mm -hmm. and then we will cancel their account. Something like that. It hasn't happened often, but it happens, and we will disable the account for that, that problem. So I would say 15,000 is probably a number you could work with in terms of the state. Uh, Representative Alming? Yes. Um, there have been for a long time, we used to be just scratch tickets. And there are people on, there was one I was told about by my convenience store operator when I was getting my paper there many years ago, who on, we, we are across from a ball bearing plant and every payday he would come in and buy um, 80 scratch tickets and then stand there and open them until he'd run out and then he'd go home with less money to his wife. <laughs> so um, that's um, scratch. So scratch tickets is something that most people, a lot of people in the state do, but a lot of people are only doing one for Christmas or five for for a Christmas present or something like that. So, um, but it's really very difficult to identify. And and what we heard when we were doing the casino work was that it's um, that a lot of gamblers that have a major problem do, and I think Representative Leapley knows, uh, do not want anybody to know and are not willing to go and get help because they're going to fix everything with the next win. Okay, we have now spent quite a bit of time on this. Um, I think the consensus, correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, no matter what, this bill needs more work, right? On the We have two issues. We have the breakage definition and then we have how do we handle the money and make sure the money is going for proper uses effectively. Um, so we are not going to exec this today. We have much more time to work on this. This is not an early bill. So we have a little bit more time so we can consider uh, if you want to move your amendment later or if other people have amendments so we have a little bit more time or maybe the right thing to do is a separate bill for some of these issues. Representative Almy? I think it would be really important to do this as a separate, well-conceived bill, but I think it would also be helpful if we could get the woman that is in charge of, of this to come talk to us, <laughs> since you really shouldn't be talking about it. Correct. I'll happily pass along the message, and I'll have her, uh, Madam Chair, if it's okay, I'll have her contact you, um, and that'll be the extent of my... Uh, but I will certainly pass along the information. In fact, excellent. Val's we can right we can notes. discuss w whether that would be um, a work session on this bill, or if it's something we wanted to do um, separately. I was have to think through the the proper format to do that. Uh, but we will, and it sounds like there is a lot of uh, interest in doing a separate bill for next term. Um, so we'll continue to explore all of those options. Another hand was being raised over there. And there's your thing, Representative Southworth. I see it. I see it now. When people lean forward, it's not it is, I apologize. It is hard to see sometimes in the corners. Uh, thank you. Um, just following up on your figure, which I appreciate, of around 15,000, um, and following up on other comments, there's similar patterns with all the different kind of addictions. My sense would be then you'd have a much smaller number which might even be two or 3,000, but those are the much more severe people who actually need much more intervention, which is gonna take a chunk of the funds. Yeah, it's a difficult number to assess only because it, it's, it's also needs and um, sort of means-based. Like I have a gentleman who wages sports betting, very large figures, very large, but he owns a Gulf Stream. And so for him, this is what he does for fun. And it's figures that would astound you, but it's not a problem for him because it's his, 
he loves to do it and he he can easily afford it so um but yeah it's right for a smaller percentage it's a it's a larger problem yeah thank you other comments okay um i guess we can close this and i should mention that i'm involved in this industry i wouldn't i'm not sure how this would impact me but i am involved in this industry um but we will close the work session on senate bill 112 and continue discussions on that okay so now we will open up and i forgot i don't have a little gavel we will now open up the public hearing on senate bill 19 and we have a non-germane amendment number 1475 hopefully in your pile and uh, we'll take a moment to look at that hold on hold on let me just see if i can find it i left them, I left them both and there's two amendments, and I put a copy of each in everyone's place. 1475, and there's also a 1603. Okay, I, let me just look, see if I can find it. Yes, okay. This, all right, everyone has it. And, um, okay, so the, we had heard that there were some interest in amendments on this bill. Um, we checked with the House Clerk. Um, he thought it would be best to do a non-germane amendment hearing so that we could make sure we discuss this publicly. So, Representative Plett, would you like to go through your amendments? Yes, thank you. Uh, and I mentioned there's two amendments, 1603 as well. They both do the same thing, uh, but different sections of the law. So they have to be uh, two different amendments. One's essentially 1603 is off of 1475. The amendments simply allow Lucky Seven to be applied over the same apply, allowed over the same 16 days that Bingo would be allowed should this bill 16, S, Senate, uh, Senate uh, uh, Bill 19 FN become law. The amendment requires a separate hearing since this House Clerk ruled that the amendment non germane. He did so because the amendment inserts wording in RSA 287E21, whereas the original bill concerned RSA 287E6. Same chapter and section, but a different subsection concerning Lucky Seven, rather than Bingo. I urge the adoption of this amendment. Thank you. And going on to 1603, it was pointed out to me by Rick Newman, thank you very much, that this wording is uh, twice in the statute. The statute may, may, may need uh, uh, ex editing uh, by, uh, and uh, have the whole thing rewritten and come back to us for approval for the re executive rewrite. But 1603, is a different section of the same the same wording. So it was in there twice where it was lucky seven was 10 days, we have to change it to 16. To, so it's consistent throughout. I actually do have a pink card from Rick Newman. So uh, when, when you're done, Representative, we'll ask him to come up and help us. <laughs> you all set? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Representative Janigian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Platt, did you mean uh... Amendment 1606, because that's what I have in front of me, not 1603. No, it's what? 1606 is mine. It looks like this. And it's different. Yeah, it's a little over. Oh, oh, another one. Oh. I meant 1603. No, that's what you said. I don't think I got to find it. I don't have 1603. All right. Okay, and then we also have another amendment. Representative Almy, you have an amendment as well. So we have three amendments. So let's talk about them all now, and then we'll ask um, the person to testify. But what, you want to explain this to us? Oh, mine too? Yeah. Um, this is... Um, Thank you. <laughs> this came from Senator Susi, and it was introduced here by... Um, Cindy, Senator Rosenwald, and they, I, through continually asking them, I finally got word back that the Senate uh, Republicans are fine, that Senator Avard in particular, who is this prime sponsor, uh, uh, 
is approves of this amendment also. Um, it was a little difficult because he was traveling and out of touch, and his second was sick, <laughs> is sick. So um, what it does is to just increase uh, the amount of money that the charities themselves can pay on volunteers that have had to take a long bus ride, uh, buy dinner, um, um, maybe pay for pens to bring for the for the bingo game, that kind of thing, um, that would um, that it, the amount of money is in the but in the uh, law now as not to exceed twenty five dollars. And $25 was put in quite a long time ago, and inflation has eaten into it. And we all have heard that they are having trouble getting volunteers for the bingo games. They have to run with volunteers in bingo and um, because of our law. And so they wanted to get an increase up to 50, meaning that the charity will get expense statement from the volunteer and agree with all or part of it and then pay them whatever that was. It doesn't mean they get $50. It means that they get whatever their expenses that the charity accepts would be. So that's all it does, but it did seem to me like a useful thing to keep the bingo games going for the people that still like to play bingo and like to socialize at bingo. I should just mention though that this, we are discussing it because we're discussing this topic and we have experts here, but um, this technically probably would not be considered germane because it is in a different section of yeah. the statute. So we may have to actually put that on the calendar for next week when we exec it, just to be fully yeah. everyone aware of what's going on here. Um, but I thought it's important that we discuss that. it. Yeah. The, the clerk has gotten quite rigorous all of a sudden. Yeah, on this particular issue, it's, <laughs> yeah. As, as a operation of a bingo game, it always would have been considered germane before, but that's yeah. what so he's we'll, doing. we'll comply with whatever he we need to it. do. <laughs> okay, um, uh, I should mention that I am involved in this industry, so I am impacted by this bill. Uh, Rick Newman, would you be available to come up and testify? Is there, and if anyone else would like to speak, please fill out a pink card. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Rick Newman, and uh, representing the uh, uh, New Hampshire Association of Charitable uh, Gaming Operators, and I should also mention, uh, I also represent the Spartans uh, Drum and Bugle uh, Corps out of Nashua, who uh, originally, uh, I testified on, on this bill at the original hearing. Just want to focus on Representative Plett's amendments and to uh, reiterate what he said, that these Amendments make the statute consistent. If you if you pass Senate Bill 19 to allow um, bingo games to go from 10 to 16 days a month, um, these two amendments would allow the sale of Lucky 7 to go from 10 to 16 days as well. I think it's just really a technical change, and I'm happy to answer any questions. No questions, Thank I don't you. think. Thank you so much. Anyone else in the audience who would like to discuss this? Questions? We have experts from lottery. Experts? Okay. Oh, Representative Phyllis. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, Representative Plett's amendment, the 1603, has a whole section about the dispensers. So are the dispensers already covered or are, is this com kind of, oh, this is, this isn't a. I think it's just reiterating I'm, existing statute, but just sh showing you the change. But it's, it says that section two is a new subparagraph. Oh, three is not, three is, never mind. 
Just forget, forget I said that. The, yeah, sometimes the way these amendments are coming back is a little confusing, in my opinion. The, the only from, change is to change 10 days to 16 days in two places for Lucky 7, period. OLS is doing things a little bit differently this year, so it's getting a little caught up with that. Yeah. Okay. Is that it? Seeing no one else signed up. Yep, go ahead. Representative Schamberg. This... Uh Amendment, Representative Platt, over here. Uh, would this have to go back to the Senate if it's amended, or is it a committee of conference it would go to? Anytime we amend something, uh, then the Senate can either concur, non concur, or request a committee of conference. Other comments, questions, testimony? Seeing none, we will now close the public hearing on. Senate Bill 19 with amendment 1475. Madam Chair, should I limit it to that or did, should I cover 1603 as well? I believe 1603 as well because it is related to that. Thank you. Yes. And That's is, what I did. And is 1606, does anyone have any questions about that? Uh, 1606, again, we will do it, we'll schedule a public hearing on that even for just five minutes just to make sure we catch everyone who has a comment on that uh and then hopefully well maybe we'll be able to exec it next week we'll see again this is not an early bill so we do have time so you can look this over and see what questions you have okay so we are now i believe done for the day and we will plan to reconvene next tuesday um in the 9 a.m to 1 kind of range. We're going to focus on that to try to get things done and to have be able to have all of you attend. Thank you so much for being here today. Next week, yes. So we're going to hear this non-germane amendment and then uh, unless we need to do any other work sessions, we will then go into an exec session. And of course, each caucus may break from time to time to discuss things and where things are going. But at a minimum, we will be taking up an exec session for Senate Bill 120, because that is an early bill and will be absolutely under deadline. Okay, so just be prepared for that. Thank you very much. We've got to save the one from school now. We're going to think about what we're going to do next week. Yeah. Okay. So one time. I'm people who started to get a Okay. So, so um, you actually, you had uh, two, two pages of. Dem Democrats, maybe we could get together briefly for 10 minutes. Can we get together briefly for 10 minutes? Um, yeah. Yes, we can follow up. We can stay here as long as we can. Yeah, I don't want the three of us to connect. I'm not here to do that. Oh, you did? Yes. My office. I sent it today. Okay. Even out to the session. Okay. 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 An email as well. That's how we can cover it. And let me go get over there. Okay. Yep. No, and Kim could have just been here real quick. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's uh let's just meet up. Yeah. Real quick. Um, I want to run something by you, and then I'll figure this all out later. All right. Yeah. We are. We are live. Uh, nine bird. Well, what are they going to do? Twenty. Um, uh, 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 Why you ask if it was just in case it was Yeah, I think. Trying to have the to do with the Well, it's interesting. My standard was a tobacco and alcohol addict.